I'm Philip Pan Baker, and welcome to a bonus edition of COVID Cryptography. So we're all locked down because of the COVID virus and everybody, or rather everybody who has the broadband that can keep up with it, is video conferencing like mad. And a lot of people are using a product called Zoom for that. And so a lot of people have been looking at the security of that product and not liking what they see. And so in this video, what I want to do is to look at some of those security issues that have been raised from the point of view of a security specialist and look at how to fix them. Because all of the problems I see are fixable. I, you know, Zoom is a company with you know, a $10 billion market cap. They have more than enough resources to fix these problems. Um, and these days we can fix almost anything. Uh, as far as security goes. Um, it's a question of will and determination and not giving up too soon. Now, in the past, there was a real conflict between security and functionality. If you look at the, some of the applications from the 1990s, PGP and SMIME or whatever, uh, they were absolutely appalling as far as the usability goes. You know, the demands that they made of the user were idiotic the user was being required to think about security all the time. And the result was the user never used them, user security features. Um, you know, that's why we have uh, email security scandals affecting presidential elections, because the cryptographic security was just rubbish as far as the usability goes. Now, you do sometimes have to make a trade-off, but over the past five, ten years, there's been a whole bunch of program applications and services, uh, things like Signal and Telegram and so on, that have proved that you don't have to make the choice between security and usability. You can have both, but you've got to be absolutely determined that that's what you're going to do. And so the takeaway here is everything that has been raised against Zoom is fixable. Uh, I don't know why anybody would think that this is going to be a long-term drag on their share price. It shouldn't be, provided that they actually fix the problems. And there's the rub, because one of the things that often happens with, in my industry is there is a security flap and, you know, there's a big rush to secure things. And then after the flap is over, well, kind of like everybody forgets about it. And the result of the security flap is a button on the app saying, make me secure. And, you know, all the big companies have done that sort of security in the past. You know, what I want to see is we do the job properly and we keep doing it. OK, so what are the security issues that were raised? Well, in, in order of fixability, uh, the first set of issues were software vulnerabilities in the product. Um, the product allegedly allowed people to take over a person's desktop and the executable uh, image that they were shipping was big, bloated and had a bunch of issues that a lot of people weren't very happy with. There are also some application design vulnerabilities. A Zoom bombing is one of them. And another of them is uh, the problem that they have identified with people having sex parties on Zoom. And finally, and this is where, this is the bit that touches on what I do most, uh, there are architectural vulnerabilities in that all the data that is passing through the conferencing service is passing through the Zoom's data centers. And some of those data centers are in cloud services that are in China. And some of the cryptographic choices that they have made are uh, really not very good at all. So we're going to be looking at each of those in turn. Uh, but before we do, I, I want to make something clear that, you know, why are we picking on Zoom? You see, the thing is that everybody in the field has software vulnerabilities. And this is why there is this peculiar thing in my industry. You know, I've been in the security industry now for almost 30 years. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we do not do is compete on security. So we sell security on as a product, but we do not compete on the security of our products. 
You know, if I see a problem with one of my competitors' products, I can, and I have in the past, called them up in private, told them what the pr problems are and how I think they should fix them. And usually they do. And they will do the same if they see a pro an issue with one of the products one of my companies uh, is doing. You know, we do not compete on security. And the reason that we don't do that in the proper security industry is, well, partly it's there, but for the grace of God go I, you know, I could be next. But also, it's a question of trust. What we're selling is confidence in the security of our products. And most people that are out there have absolutely no ability to evaluate the security of a cryptographic product. In fact, that's why I'm making the cryptography course to inform consumers of cryptographic applications so they can see the good stuff from the snake oil. And so if I start beating up on my competitor's crypto product um, and I convince people that it is insecure, that's also going to reflect badly on my product because people are going to be saying, well, they were insecure how do i know that yours isn't as well and so we do not compete on security we do whatever we can to help our competitors fix our security issues you know unless we think that they're selling snake oil you know if somebody is selling stuff that uh, i think is snake oil crypto oh yeah then i'll go after them i'll go after them big time so one of the things that happens is that some people get held to a different security standard than others. And especially when you're the new kid on the block. And, you know, Zoom video, you know, you can see me on the screen. So, of course, security is going to be absolutely critical. This is going to be the most secure application I need. Surely, yes. Well, no. All right. Would you believe that there are vendors of you know paid subscription password managers that have been breached not just once not just twice but three four more times and all because they have crappy security you know they're selling a password security product and you know i don't see those companies being hauled up in the press or held to account, even though they're selling a, you know, what should be the most secure product on your machine, but they're not held to account. And so, you know, th th there is a lot of double standards going on. And in particular, when I used to work for certification authorities, uh, there was a very clear difference between the security standards that were held, that the certificate authorities were held to, and those that the browser providers held themselves to. I mean, I, it's very rare that you don't see that a month goes by without more vulnerabilities being uh, disclosed in multiple browsers. You know, that's the norm. You know, we stop reporting security vulnerabilities in browsers because, you know, they're just routine. Uh, breaches of certificate authorities are exceedingly rare. You know, uh, I've, I've not heard of one, uh, f an actual breach for over a decade now. Um, but, you know, uh, Symantec was booted out of the industry and forced to sell its CA uh, because one of the browser providers uh, decided they didn't like the way, the details of some of the ways that they were managing their crypto. And so there are very definitely double standards being applied and so when you see people attacking Zoom, think about the security of the products their company produces and look at the um, vulnerability lists and you know, just compare how many vulnerabilities are being found. I, I think you'll find that very interesting. So why are people holding Zoom to a higher standard? Well, it's a new application uh, as far as most people are concerned. You know, most people are not used to uh, being um, on, on the internet. And so when we have a transition in place, people get really worried about security. And, you know, when mention of China comes up in the context of, you know, when we're all locked down because of COVID, you know, a certain type of people get really bent out of shape. 
And you know, yes, video conferencing is a security sensitive application, but it isn't the only one. And you know, there is a thing that happens with um, familiarity breeds a complacency. You know, people who are getting bent out of shape about Zoom not being end-to-end -end secure have no problems with their telephone not being end-to-end -end secure. And you know, you know how telephone conversations happen today? Even if you've got a landline, that telephone conversation is going over the internet and you've got no idea where those packets are traveling and you've got no end-to-end -end security. So the bar has been raised to Zoom, for Zoom uh, and it's not raised to a, a ridiculous level. What I'm saying is the bar should be raised for everybody and not just for one application because it happens to be the one that we've noticed might be a problem. The bar should be the same for all of Zoom's competitors, for WebEx and Teams and everything else. And it should be the same for all the other products that we're using. We should be holding Dropbox and Slack and all the other companies that we're depending upon in this COVID lockdown situation, but are not providing true end-to-end -end security. Because here's the thing, end-to-end -end security isn't a you know, security is never a feature of a application. It's a feature of a system. So if you're using an end-to-end -end secure video conferencing system, but you're not, but your um, file sharing application or your chat conferencing application isn't end-to-end -end secure, then you do not have an end-to-end -end secure system. And so if we're going to get anywhere, we have to make everything end-to-end -end secure. Okay, so let's look at the first of those problems. Um, in so writing secure code. And this is really, really hard. And this is not something that I've actually, um, you know, I, I've not been a primarily a div uh, an implementer of applications for decades. Uh, you know, writing solid, secure code is a specialist's skill in its own right. And, you know, implement applications are especially difficult because they're always exposed to a communication channel that allows an attacker access. And this is one of the problems I, have, I find very difficult to get across to many people, which is it's not just the code you write. You know, when we're talking about, you know, people are, uh, uh, talking about the security of C or C Sharp or Java or whatever, somebody will say, well, I can write secure code. It's just a question of being careful. It's kind of like, well, you know, whether you can write secure code is beside the point. It's irrelevant. The question is, can all the people that you hire to write the code with you, can they all write secure code? Because it, you know, it doesn't, the attacker doesn't mind whose vulnerability they exploit. It can be the chief programmer or it can be the lowest minion that an exploit is an exploit. So if you're using insecure tools that your minions cannot use securely, then the blame goes to you, not the minion who you gave the wrong tool to. So you have to be exceptionally disciplined in your coding. And here's the sort of thing that can come up. Um, it's called a buffer run over exploit. And it's very co a very common way in which internet facing code is breached. So what happens is the application is expecting a message to be a certain length. So 500 bytes say. And what the attacker does is to send a message that instead of sending 500 bytes, sends 5,000 bytes or 50,000 bytes or even more. And so when the computer stores this information, it overwrites the end of uh, the space that was allocated to it uh, because it's not got a check in there uh, to see whether you're overrunning the buffer. And so as it turns out, if you do this with the programming, the way that we've decided to implement chips and programming languages and whatever, when you overrun that buffer, it will 
start overwriting a, an area of the machine called the stack. And that is the control store of the um, machine. And the control, so what that means is that when the um, machine is looking for the next instruction to execute, the stack is involved in deciding where to go. And that makes it very, very sad. You know, basically what we end up with is a situation in which the attacker can now control the machine because they've overwritten the control store. Uh, I won't go into the full details of how that works here. I'll do an, uh, a separate m module on it later on. So when you're looking at code uh, to see whether it's robust or not, uh, what a lot of people do is they rely on uh, what's sometimes called code smells. You know, if you look at the way in which the code is written, that tells you a lot about the habits of the programmer. And you might have, just as you might have somebody who uh, comes into the office every day, whose clothes are dirty, who's um, and torn and ripped and so on, uh, who turns out to be a really conscientious uh, worker who gets everything done perfectly. But you know that, you know, chances are they're not going to be uh, a completer finisher type. Uh, it's the same thing with code. And so we look at things like what language is it written in? If you're writing in C, well, you're vulnerable to those buffer overrun attacks. And a certain amount of the processor's concentration time all the time has to be focused on not introducing a buffer overrun attack. And so that's a ding. Uh, modern languages like C Sharp, Java, Rust, uh, all the things that the large um, companies like Microsoft, Google, um, Apple and so on are using as their go-to languages. Um, th they all have checks built into them to prevent buffer overrun exploits automatically. So the computer thinks about that problem and the programmer doesn't need to. It's not just a question of security here. It's also uh, efficiency because you know, a programmer that's not having to test for those mistakes the computer can find uh, can be more productive. It's also things like looking at the versions of the support libraries that are being used. And you know, linking to uh, versions of a support library that came out in 2015 and has a bunch of security vulnerabilities uh, checked against it, you know, that's, that's bad practice. Um, doing anything using 32-bit applications these days, you know, that's just, that's just sad. Um, you know, the, the, there haven't been 32-bit uh, Windows or Apple uh, machines being sold for a decade now. You know, the, the industry has moved from 32 bits to 64. Um, if you're trying to support idiots who are trying to run uh, their machine in 32 bits, then that's just sad. I mean, I, I don't know why uh, Microsoft even supported 32 bits as long as they did. Um, all the 32-bit stuff it sh it is end of line life as far as I'm concerned. Um, shipping a 32-bit binary, that's, that's icky. Uh, and also whether the protection modes are turned on. Um, as buffer run issues became uh, a serious problem, uh, what some of the company, the operating system and chip makers did was they developed hardware protection modes that make it harder but not impossible for an attacker to exploit a buffer run no overflow. And so those should be turned on. So people have been looking at the binaries and some folk have been alleging that uh, Zoom has uh, not met the highest uh, security standard. And, you know, that's bad, but, you know, it's all fixable. You know, this is stuff that you just go through the checklist. Uh, it's a punch list and you just fix it all. Okay. Now, a more a subtler problem is um, zoom bombing. That's not subtle to, to the victim. So what happens is that a bunch of people are in a zoom video conferencing and a prankster joins the call and starts uh, streaming porn or whatever at the people in the meeting. And the reason that this can happen is that the 
or access control system that's been implemented here is essentially a meeting identifier and a password and even the password the password is optional and so if somebody is saying i'm setting up a zoom meeting here's the meeting id and password to join and they post that onto facebook or slack uh, a public slack channel or whatever well people have uh, search engines that are looking for that stuff they say hey and uh, then they can uh, merrily join that call um, and you know this is just a problem with the um, access control regime that zoom have chosen and the second problem that comes up are zoom sex parties and some people are using zoom believe it or not they're using zoom to hold orgies and photograph each other in and zoom is very worried about that and has announced that they're developing an artificial intelligence system to detect and stop these in incredibly important breaches of their service and you know it's kind of like why who asked you to do this i mean like you know did the u.s congress you know did some um one of putin's lackeys in the u.s congress uh tell you to uh, shut down the sex parties you know why are you doing that uh it's none of your business how people are using your product if you are providing infrastructure you're a utility you know it's like uh, does uh, does the electricity company worry about uh, whether its electricity is being used for uh, a vibrator actually one of the interesting things about the um, early electricity industry is that uh, one of the killer applications for electricity in the home was actually the home massage device and i found this out uh, reading uh, a book by um, norman uh, <laughs> in which uh, he has this advertisement for you know all the uses of the uh, home electric motors the idea where you buy one motor and you could use it with all these different gadgets and he's making a point about you know the motor you know these days we have a motor in everything we buy but what he misses i think is that if you look at all the applications as one application that is dead center and appears not just once but twice and that is the home massage application so yeah i mean like you know if you're a utility it is none of your business what the customers are using your product for and for me this is actually one of the uh, most worrying security problems with Zoom in that I don't want to have a infrastructure provider to me that is making moral judgments of any kind about how I make I use their product. Um, you know, if they have some weird conservative authoritarian agenda shutting down sex, that, that is a serious problem to me. And so, you know, this might just be an attempt to stop the Zoom bombing by preventing people streaming porn, but, you know, it's a pretty stupid way of doing it. But at this point, all we want Zoom to do is to keep as many people in their houses locked down and as happy as possible until this blows over. And we really don't care how Zoom goes about that. And so we do not want zoom going on some weird morality crusade and here's the other thing these two issues may well be linked the reason that that zoom bombing is possible is because of a weak authentication model you know username and password is a weak um model uh the anybody who knows the password is going to be able to get into that uh, meeting and so if you're going to use something like this in the corporate environment, you're going to need a stronger model and you want to be able to restrict meetings to company employees, employees and contractors or um, uh, employees and um, customers uh, and uh, partners, whatever. And so you want to have some infrastructure that can say, hey, this person is a credentialed user a credentialed employee of company a this person's a credentialed user of uh company b and you know that type of infrastructure 
is going to require people to invest a little bit of effort up front in order to get the right credentials that allow them to um, use the system. And, you know, if you have an application like Sex Parties with a group of people who are extremely well motivated to um, apply for those credentials, well, that's a, an early adopter community you should be looking at who can help you debug your application before you've got the usability completely fluent and completely transparent. So just, you know, it's weird. Don't worry about how people are using your product. Think about how you make your product is secure. So the other thing about people holding sex parties is that those are people who've got real, real concerns about security. Well, some of them do. Uh, uh, other people upload the videos afterwards onto uh, Fet Life, but you know that's the, that's the way they roll. Uh, most folk don't, and they get very upset. I mean, you know, I'm always being asked, "How can I secure the uh, nude pictures I've to taken of, of myself?" Well, actually, no, I'm not. Nobody ever asks me that question. What they ask me is, "I took the photographs. They've leaked. How do I stop it?" And, you know, then it's kind of like a discussion of horses and barn doors and so on. So this is a, a motivated, a privacy motivated group. So take notice of them. And what we really need here is true end to end security. And to do there are ways that you can do that using public key cryptography, public key infrastructure and so on. And Telegram and Signal show that you can do it securely without making it a, a, a real pain to use. But here's the thing. Yes, people are getting worried about the cloud services being hosted by um, hostile dictatorships. And especially where dictatorships where the national sport is espionage. Um, Sun Tzu uh, was really, who wrote The Art of War, really, really keen on espionage. And that's something that, you know, Every executive, corporate executive in China has had to read Sun Tzu's Art of War. Uh, well, everybody, every officer in NATO has to as well. But, you know, so it's not unusual for one division of a Chinese company to have people paid to spy on another division of that same company. You know, espionage is the national sports. But the th here's the thing. It's not just China that's your problem. There are many countries that engage in commercial espionage. Uh, I was reading this wonderful article in which uh, in the U.S. press, in which the um, you know the, the the U.S. paper of record was ragging on the French who had been caught trying to spy on the uh, American delegation uh, on behalf of Airbus and how Airbus had tried to steal this uh, contract. And then you read through the report and how did America know that? Well, they were spying on Airbus. So, yeah, I mean, like national intelligence agencies are very frequently co-opted for grubby commercial interests and often political interests. And it gets very sad. And yeah. So the gold standard is what we call end to end security. So the idea here is that all the data is going to be encrypted at one end of the communication and it will only be decrypted at the other end. And if you read the uh, articles by Zoom, you know, they were saying, well, we're doing end to end security. Yeah, but the thing is, where are your ends? And, you know, if one of your end things that you're counting as an end is a cloud service hosted in China, well, that's not really what most people understand as end-to-end -end security. But here's the other thing. Trying to define what you really want from end-to-end -end security turns out to be ridiculously hard because, you know, is the end a person? Well, don't know about you, but I cannot do elliptic curve com computations in my head. I don't think Alice and Bob can either. Is it the device that Alice and Bob are holding? Is it the enterprise that we're trying to interact with? And so when you start to look at what end-to-end -end really means, 
it's a lot more subtle and a lot uh, more complicated than simply saying, oh, we'll throw TLS at it or we'll throw SMIME at it and everything will be fine. And it's really hard to do something like a video conferencing service um, with a true end-to-end -end model. And you certainly can't use um, password security for it or any credential for that matter, unless the place where the credentials are being verified is what you're calling the other endpoint. If you have a system in which Alice goes to the cloud service, authenticates herself to the cloud service, and then the cloud service sets up a conversation with Bob, the packets flowing between Alice and Bob can be end-to-end uh, -end secure, well, end-to-end -end encrypted. But you've not got end-to-end -end security here because anything that the cloud service has told Alice she can do, the cloud service can also do. And the only way that you can get around those restrictions is if you use uh, public key cryptography. And in particular, a type of public key cryptography called threshold cryptography, which is so new that there isn't even um, an international standard for doing any of it yet. In fact, just yesterday, uh, I was in a meeting proposing that we start work in the IETF to develop a standard. So um, at the moment, there is no end-to-end -end secure video conferencing system. Um, there are only pieces that have parts that are encrypted end-to-end. -end. And this is simply a consequence of the fact that doing the job right is really hard. We've done it with OpenPGP, we've done it with SMIME, but at the cost of an immense um, impact on the user uh, usability model. Um, and, you know, using those applications, um, you need a level of technical expertise that, you know, it's kind of like uh, Doctor Strange from uh, Marvel level of complexity. Yeah. And so most of the stuff that's being used there is not truly end to end. And Dropbox isn't. Uh, Slack isn't. Um, even Signal. I don't think Signal really counts as end to end as far as I'm concerned. Because one of the things that I have to download is a closed application that Signal's provided with me that I've got no realistic way of auditing. Oh, and it demands that it be upgraded and replaced, um, seems every time I start, the, start it up, it wants to update itself. So, you know, at the moment, nothing uh, that we use there is really end-to-end -end security. It's just end-to-end -end encryption, which is a different thing. And so, as far as I'm concerned, if we're going to do true end-to-end, -end, we need to have some infrastructure out there that would issue client-side public key credentials so that there is some service out there that, al that is allowing um, Bob to upload his credentials and then when Alice, Carol, or whoever else wants to talk with Bob, they can get the credentials they need for that end-to-end -end security uh, from the from that service and then we need to have a way of locking down that service and locking down the trust model making that end-to-end -end secure and if we will and there have been attempts to build that type of service in the past and they kind of ran into the problem that most people were not that interested in end-to-end -end security um, and they gave up well, maybe now that people are getting worried about Zoom, you know, maybe they'll go further. But here's the thing. If we were ever to build an infrastructure of that type, it would have to secure more than just one product. This is my big problem with the Zoom security model. Sorry, with the signal security model. And that is that it is a locked in closed community. And, you know, end to end security for signal is interesting. You know, I use that. But that's not enough. I need end-to-end -end security for my Dropbox, my Slack, my email, 
my voice, my video. If I want, if I'm going to get end-to-end -end security, it has to all be secure. Just one part of it being secure, you know, is closing up only one of the holes in the fence. And you know, if I've got a fence with uh, six holes in, closing one hole isn't that interesting. And you know what? The, the holes that I worry about most are not the Zoom conference holes. It's the Slack channel. It's the Dropbox channel. Those are the places where there's going to be the most stuff at risk. So if we're going to lock this down, locking down just Zoom is pointless. We need to lock everything down in a single consistent model, which means it has to be infrastructure, which means that it has to be an open standard. And persuading people to do that is going to be really hard. And I know because that's precisely what I've been trying to do for five years now. And the mathematical mesh is an attempt to provide exactly that type of infrastructure. So how do we move forward? Well, you know, Ahab has his whale, you know, the mesh might be my whale. But you know what, I, I've got an open framework, it's open source, all the specifications are open, and I can show how that it all works individually. I'm just in, in the uh, last stages of producing the first release that will provide people with a true end-to-end -end secure password manager. And this would potentially provide us with the way of making it really easy to use public key credential on all the many devices we now use and make that type of security fluent and easy to use. And I don't, you know, mine might not be the end solution, but it is at this point sufficiently developed to be a proof of uh, existence. So, the, so what I want to end up with here is, yes, Zoom has problems, but don't believe the folk that are trying to tell you that they've got unusual problems. They don't. Zoom is just going through the usual growing pain that every internet company uh, ends up doing, where people suddenly realize there are security uh, concerns with the product and suddenly starts beating them up. Um, it happens, you know, happened to Unix back in the day. I remember when Unix, uh, was the operating system nobody would use because it just wasn't secure. The security model was a joke, at least as far as the VMS and the um, IBM boys would tell you. So Zoom has problems, but they're fixable. We should fix them. And but what's more important is to fix everything else as well, because otherwise we'll just have a fence that instead of having six holes, have five. And we need to fix all the holes in the fence, not just the ones that the New York Times is writing about. So thank you very much for watching. Please click like, please subscribe, and please uh, take a look at my uh, introduction to cryptography course, um, COVID cryptography. Thank you very much.